Sister Ann.
Welcome to this service of worship. We are grateful and blessed to have our pastor, Elder Wayne Gibson, to bring our message to this morning. Our theme for today is the bread of life. And as you have probably already noticed, we have an assortment of different breads on our worship setting today. French bread, Italian bread, I think there's some rye bread, there's maybe some whole wheat, just all kind of breads. These breads are just as unique as you and I are. All of these breads, even though they're different in their own way and unique in their own way, they are all alike in one way. They would not be here if they had not been blessed with soil, water, air, sunshine. And we know that these elements are provided to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So each of these has a touch of Jesus in them. We are also unique. Each of us are a little different in our own way. But we know that we're all alike in one way. We are each created by our Lord God the Creator. So today, in our service, we've asked three people to share testimonies. We've asked them to share a testimony on how has Jesus been your bread of life, and how will you commit yourself to him? And after they share their testimonies, as a symbolism of the bread of life, they're going to take a piece of bread. And they can take from any assortment that they wish. And then, after some special music, you and I will be given the opportunity to come forth and to partake of a piece of bread. And as you do this, do this in symbolism of Jesus, our bread of life. And then, when you finish, as you walk to your seat, silently think of your commitment that you have just made to serve Jesus, the bread of life. And so now, Marina, will you lead us in our call to worship, if you will open your bulletins. We are part of the same body. We will be honest and work hard. We will be kind and merciful and forgive others. Let love be our guide as Christ loved us.
Good morning, everybody. Could we bow our heads for the invocation, please? Heavenly Father, it's always a blessing and an honor to serve up with these fine people, dear God. It's a blessing to be here today. Heavenly Father, I ask, dear God, that you fill this church today with your spirit. Fill our hearts and our minds. And I ask you, dear Lord, to be with Brother Wayne this morning as he brings the message. I ask, dear Heavenly Father, that we can use what he says today as the bread of life. I ask, dear Lord, that you be with each and every one of us through this service today so that we will feel your love. Use it today, dear God, and going forward. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward? Please pray with me. God, where will your spirit lead us today? Help us be fully awake and ready to respond. Grant us courage to risk something new and become a blessing of your love and peace. In your name we pray, amen.
Good morning. Sheila and I were laughing just now. I don't know if you saw us there. Well, you know, I got two sets of glasses here, one on each side. I told her, I said, well, it's really going to depend on what side the pulpit I'm on at the time, you know. I didn't want to be where I couldn't see, so I got a pair of glasses over here. And that's really not the reason. Uh, I had these glasses this morning, and the frame kind of cracked on me, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to use them. So I just want to be sure I can see you. I don't know whether you're going to be able to see me or not, but I want to be sure I can see you. I guess all of you noticed this morning during the offertory that we had the Wilson clan that took up our money. So if we go up missing any money, you'll know who to see. And we, yeah, we starting out with Stan, so he's the patriarch, you know, and we're kind of working our way down, you know, to the little one here. So, but they're all in the same clan here. So just bear, bear that in mind. I am so glad to be here and be part of this service. And I'm sitting here looking out, and I'm not going to call any names. Thank you. <laughs> but there are some of you that I am very pleased to see. Of course, I'm, I'm happy to see all of you. Don't misunderstand me. But there are a couple, three or four that's here with us this morning that we really are so happy to have them come and join us and hope that uh, we'll see them a lot in the coming days. This morning, I want to start out with David's assistance, and we're going to show you a picture. I think most of us recognize that, but the question I want to pose to you as you look at that picture is, who is this Jesus. Now you may sit there and think that's a pretty odd, silly question for me to be asking, considering the people that are sitting before me, mainly you, members of the church, friends of the church, believers in Christ, and all those kind of things. But it's a question that has been asked for hundreds of years. And we as Christians attempt to answer that question. Now we know that this picture depicts Jesus in a different way maybe than we usually see him. He's laughing. He's having a good time. He's sharing with a bunch of young people. And if you look at that, excuse me, if you look at that picture, then you get the impression that He's just another guy. He is doing pretty much what you and I would probably be doing if we were sitting with a bunch of kids and one of them on his knee or and all. And so he's just enjoying being who he is. But we know Jesus in a different light. We believe that this Jesus is the Son of God. He was born as a baby to a virgin mother named Mary in a stable that was for animals to reside in. He was laid on a manger of straw in a little town in Judea called Bethlehem. We know that as he entered into his life that he performed many miracles of healing. He made the lame and crippled to walk. He made, restored the sight to those that were blind. He healed the lepers. He even restored life to some that were dead. He performed miracles, and John referred to some last week in his remarks. He fed 5,000 people with two fishes and five loaves of bread. He calmed the tempest on the Sea of Galilee and walked on water. And finally, he was accused by the religious leaders of that time and judged by a Roman governor and sentenced to die by crucifixion on a cross. And three days later, 
He rose from that tomb. And we believe that he lives today. Now that is just a short, concise synopsis of who this person that we call Jesus Christ is. But I want to pose the question, is that who Jesus is to you? Now we know all those things about him, but is that really who Jesus is to you? So the question is, who is this Jesus? David, if you will, take that picture now. Before the coming of Christ, a long time before the coming of Christ, Moses was chosen by God to lead the children of Israel. And Moses wanted to know, who is this God that the Hebrews are so wrapped up in and worship and think so much of? Who is this God? And so we know in the book of Exodus, recounting some of the events of Moses' life, that he saw that burning bush. And we all know that from the Ten Commandments and how that was portrayed. A bush that was on fire that was not being consumed. And he went to that bush and heard that voice and told him that he was on holy ground. And he told, he asked God, when I go back and I encounter and meet with these, the children of Israel and say to them that the God of our fathers has sent me and they're going to ask me, who is he? What is his name? What shall I say? And we know from the scriptures there that God simply said, I am that I am. Say to the children of Israel that I am has sent me. So when God sent Jesus to this earth to give us some kind of tangible evidence, some kind of example, something that we could see and talk to and relate to. When he sent Jesus, surely it's only natural that Jesus was here to reveal God in the flesh. And so when he tried to explain to those that he encountered who he was, it's only natural that he would use the term I am. We know from the scriptures that Jesus told each one of us, those that he was in front of, those that he encountered, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the light. I am the door. I am the gateway. I am the Lamb of God. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of the Most High God. I am, I am, I am. So with all of these I am and all of these different connotations that Jesus gave us as to who he was, the question still is, who is this Jesus? John referred to a scripture that I'm going to read to you and hope these glasses will stay on me. It's from the sixth chapter. And I speak, when I say John, I'm speaking of John Parker. But I'm going to read to you from another John, the disciple John. And in the sixth chapter, the 35th verse and the 40th verse, Jesus addressing those individuals that was with him then. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. 
Another I am saying, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And it is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up. In the resurrection of the just in the last day. What do you take this morning from those words? What does that scripture mean to you this morning? Well, I think it's pretty obvious, and Jesus is not a loaf of bread. He's not one of these loaves that we have before you this morning. But yet he says, I am the bread of life. So those words have to have some kind of meaning for us. So in many ways, in many ways, Jesus is bread. He is bread. You know that we know that to the Jewish people, bread was a symbol of life, nourishment. But it must be eaten. It doesn't matter how good bread is. It doesn't matter how much nourishment that it will provide. It doesn't matter how, much it, how good it smells when it's first baked. And any of you that's been in Atlanta Bread or any of those bakeries or those places that bake bread, you know what that smells like. You know how good that bread smells. But it doesn't matter until you take that bread and you eat it and that it becomes part of us. Until we consume that bread... It does us no good. All the things we might know about it does us no good. So I suggest that in a like manner that Jesus is our bread. There's a sophisticated semblance between encountering and experiencing Jesus and experiencing eating bread. You see, if we really, truly experience Jesus in our life, if he really is the Messiah, if he really is the Son of God, if he really is all those things that he says, I am, then experiencing him is just like experiencing that nourishment that we get from a loaf of bread. And it is experiencing life at its very best. Life is like savoring that special loaf that has been freshly baked for each one of us. And you could almost say, you know, when you sit down and you tear off that piece of warm bread and you eat it, or you dip it in some, something or another that enhances that, t that taste, you sit there and you say, you know, it just doesn't get any better than this. And I've been there, I know. It just doesn't get any better than this. The one thing that I believe, brothers and sisters, is that when we take Jesus into our life, just like we take that loaf of bread... Just as when we consume that loaf of bread, if we're experiencing Jesus in that like manner, I believe without any doubt that we can never be the same. You see, Jesus never leaves us the same. And I would also suggest to you this morning that if you are the same, if you're the same person and you think the same and you act the same and you live the same, I have to suggest that you 
have not truly experienced Jesus in your life. God sent Jesus into this world that the world, you and I, we're the world, that through Christ that we might be saved. Jesus said, no man, no man, no woman, no child, no person, no one comes unto the Father except by me. And that pretty much doesn't leave too many options. I am convinced that God sent Jesus to show us the plan. That was God's purpose. Jesus did a lot of things. And he shared a lot of things. And he performed a lot of miracles. And he did a lot of things when he was on this earth, when he walked among men as flesh and blood. But that was not the reason he came. God sent Jesus to show us the plan. The plan for salvation. And make no mistake, brothers and sisters, there's no other plan. There's only one plan. Jesus said, I am the way. There is no other way. Now we sometimes in our hard headedness want to find another way. We're looking for that other route. We're looking for that secondary way to get to heaven. But there is no other way. There is no other plan that we can follow. And I think we know that if we choose, if we choose the plan of Jesus, which was God's plan, that God is bound by his promises. All the things that God promised for you and I, he's bound by those promises. If we follow the plan of Jesus, that's all we have to do. But... But if we choose the other way, if we choose our way, if we choose the way of the world, if we choose some other way that we think is going to get us to the pearly gates, I promise you that we have no promise. Nothing God promised us holds true. Nothing. He's only bound if we choose the plan that he sent his son to institute and to show us. John says in the 44th chapter, the 44th verse of chapter 6, No man cometh unto me except he doeth the will of my Father who has sent me. That... Excuse me. Do the will of my Father who has sent me. And this is the will of him who has sent me. That ye receive the Son. For the Father beareth record of him. And he who receiveth the testimony. And doeth the will of him who sent me. I will raise him up. In the resurrection of the just. Twice Jesus has referred to that resurrection. Twice. He has told us he will raise us up in that resurrection if we choose his way, his plan. You know, we don't speak much, don't ministers don't, about the book of Revelations. I'm really not sure why. Except for the fact that in that book, there are many things that are recorded there that God wanted us to know. But a lot of them are not fun times. A lot of the things that we read in the book of Revelations are not things that we really want to talk about and think about. 
But I want to share with you this morning the testimony of John as revealed to him by God in a dream or vision that he wanted us to know. And in this book of Revelation, so many times John starts each verse with, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. He saw with his eyes, his mind's eye, his heart, some way that vision was made clear to him. And he let us know what God was revealing to him. So let me read to you from the book of Revelations, the 20th chapter. And it says, And I saw an angel come down out of heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years shall be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which was not worship and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither their uh, received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And I saw a great throne, a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in those books according to their works. You ever heard that? And the sea gave up the dead which was in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which was in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. I don't know how you feel about that scripture. But I am convinced that these things, brothers and sisters, will come to pass. I don't believe that was an imagination of John. I don't believe it was something that he made up. I truly believe that God wanted us to know what the last dispensation of time was going to be like. And what events would come to pass? I believe with every fiber of my being that those things that are recorded in the book of Revelations will come to pass. The only question is, where will you be? Where will you be? Will our lives and the choices, the choices now that we have, will our lives and the choices that we make give us a chance to be part of that resurrection that Jesus refers to? Will you be one of those people? Will we be one of the folks that will reign with Jesus a thousand years? Will you be one of those people? Simply the choice is ours. Verse 47 and 48 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath 
everlasting life. I am that bread of life. My question to you this morning, brothers and sisters, is Is Jesus the bread of life for you? What does he mean to you? Is he just someone that was born in a stable? Is he just someone that fed 5,000 people, two little fishes, and a loaf of bread? Who is this Jesus? We've invited three individuals to share testimonies with us this morning. And I hope that we, I wish we had everyone that could stand up and bear their testimony this morning about who the Christ is to them. Is he that living bread? And if not, why is he not? But we hope that three individuals here will share it with you this morning. And we're going to invite John, if he will, to be the first to come forward and share his testimony about Jesus being the bread of life. It's always difficult being a Christian and living by those values, but it's also the single thing that has made my life what it is today. Without Christ, I don't know that I could have dealt with the highs and lows of life. I find myself, when I do not focus on God and on Jesus Christ, seeking that bread of grace, that ever-forgiving Lord. The bread of life is what I believe in, and it is who I am today. In a few moments, we will leave this place and go our separate ways, most of us to a meal. Most likely, the meal will include some type of bread. Can I suggest something? As you are eating, take that bread you have and think about Jesus and what he is in your life, the bread of life. Let's ask ourselves, have we consumed Jesus Christ into our life? Have we come to him to do and believe in him? Have we surrendered our lives to him? If we have made Jesus Christ our bread of life, then take the bread, worship him, and thank him that he has promised to be with you, to meet your needs, and to be with you always to satisfy your hunger and thirst. My favorite bread today is the bread of hope. If I take the letters hope, H-O-P-E, I offer these words of thought. Hope offers peace everlasting. Within the four walls of the church I grew up in and the four walls of my mother's home, my brother and I learned this incredible thing called the power of prayer and faith. And it was never more needed than in the summer of 1981 when our mother was diagnosed with a, a very aggressive form of bone cancer. Uh, this cruel disease took its toll as the months came and went, and the morphine never lasted four hours. So. Needless to say, there were days that we were very distraught. But it never failed. It looked like when we were having a terrible day, the doorbell would ring, and there stood the minister from her church. She attended the Presbyterian church. And sometimes it was the minister from this congregation and members. And the prayers these people brought into that home and said over her and us were so comforting. And when they left, I felt, you know, I can get through this. I can get through this terrible situation as bad as it is. I'm going to make it. 
It was like manna from heaven. I completely felt re refurbished. Life is not fair, but God is so good. And as the storms of my life have come and gone, I find myself referring to those little verses that I learned when I was in Sunday school and catechism class. Little verses like, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Take no thought for tomorrow. The Lord is my refuge and strength. But my favorite one I learned. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This past Tuesday was my mother's birthday, better known to everybody here as Peggy. And you can imagine, as that day was filled with a mixture of sadness and joy, as I reflected on my parents. My parents always made it easy for me to accept Christ's bread of life by the examples they led in their lives. Whenever there were challenges in our life, my parents always said the same thing. They said, pray about it and go to church. My mother would sit every morning out in her swing, and that's where she loved to pray. After I graduated from Auburn, I really didn't want to leave Mobile. And one day after church, standing right up here, I talked with Robert Fornell, and he suggested that I contact a company called QMS. I asked him, what did QMS do? And he says, well, I don't know. And I said, well, how do you know about QMS? And he said, well, I'm the CFO there. And um, I asked him, well, that's pretty odd. He says, I can't figure it out. And so at any rate, um, that led to a tremendous career for me and, and where I, I very much cherish that. Spring forward to today and we're sort of doing the same thing for Trey. As many of you know, Trey has been a missionary for the homeless in Denver for two years, and after that he was discerning to enter a brotherhood um, that would be you know, for the rest of his life. And ultimately, he, his day job is a solar engineer in Denver, and after prayer and consideration, he's moving back to Mobile, where he is dating a young lady that he met in second grade. And so we're now in search of a job, of course, in this area. Well, I'm thankful beyond words for the bread of life. And I pray that like my parents, I will be a blessing to my family and to others. Before Judy comes up and shares with us, I just wanted to inject this picture. A little bit different than what we usually see, the pictures of Jesus. And if you haven't recognized that picture yet, it's the recreation of the face of Jesus that was described by the young boy that died on an operating table and was featured in the movie and the book, Heaven is for real. And this is the picture that he described as the face of Jesus as he remembers it in that experience. I believe in my heart that this is the face of Jesus. Judy.
today where Jesus walked and found him a close to me.
Go now, having made your commitment, walked where Jesus walked, knowing you will be filled by the bread of life.